Red Dead Redemption 2 is filled with crazy details. Like the first time I kicked a chicken, I won't lie, I definitely did it more than once. What is Red Dead Redemption 2? Holy crap. Whoa, question. The prequel and sequel simultaneously in a way to Red Dead Redemption. The sequel to one of my favorite games of all time. A massive, epic, open world Western game. It is basically a cowboy fantasy game. Ultimate cowboy simulator with a really cool story. That's the very boring description of it. Really, it is. One of the most ridiculously ambitious video games that anyone has ever taken the pains to create. A monstrous, gigantic, huge, mungus, amazing, immersive, groundbreaking, vitally important artistic expression. I think it's just such a miracle that this game even exists. It is a toy that is also art. My first memory of Red Dead Redemption 2 and actually playing the game is that opening like fade out of you just trudging through the snow. The opening hour of Red Dead Redemption 2 for me was honestly a slog. Um, at first I thought that a lot of the criticisms I'd seen about the game were correct. The game starts slow as hell, like really slow, like almost like JRPG slow. It's frustrating to trudge through that snow, the wind in your face, the fact that you can't see anything. It feels oppressive. The amount of times I've replayed the game and I have to go like, oh god damn, this, this stupid open snow tutorial thing. But the first time I played it, it sets the tone so perfectly. You're already on your back foot. This starts with you in the middle of a situation, a dire situation in which you are just trudging in snow with a group of people you don't know yet, but you know you're in it together. And it took its own sweet time. I appreciated that. And while it's not an exciting opening, it does a pitch perfect way of painting the scene. Even if you think that you're bored by it or something, there will be something in that section that you're meant to experience as a player. And the game would fundamentally not be the same thing had you not gone through that. So we getting out of this hellhole? We're gonna try. Coming out of the snowy area from the intro of the game and into Valentine for me was when I, it just that was when I fell in love with Red Dead Redemption 2. It makes that feeling of taking off your big coat and getting on your horse and riding and seeing the sun and all the animals and the grass and the water and all that stuff, all the more rewarding. That was straight up like getting out of the jail dungeon thing from the beginning of Oblivion and seeing the big verdant green hills in front of you and being like, oh yeah, it's time for video game. I love that moment. It's sort of as if the game has gone, okay, now you understand what this game is and how to play it. Let's come down the mountain and find the spot outside of Valentine. Here comes the world. Snow's getting thinner, world's getting warmer. Yeah, I'm gonna love this. It's almost difficult to like match that feeling of awe when entering a world where you realize everything you see, you can go to, you can touch. The draw distance, holy shit. Looking out into the distance, I mean, it's every backdrop is a painting. The actual setting of it makes you feel things in a way that a lot of other video games don't. I've described it as a world, not a playground. Whereas I think GTA games are like playgrounds, but when you play Red Dead Redemption 2, you are soaking up this world. And that really set the stage for the adventure, I would say. And then it's like, okay, now you have another chance. And so that's what you should treat this as. Let's go, boy. You did really feel like you were camped way outside of town. And then anytime you had to go do something, you had to like, all right, rustle up your horse and go into town. It almost felt like a real life commute. Valentine is a small town. It's just kind of this quintessential classic Western town. Valentine is the coolest town ever because it is like an old cowboy saloon in town that I could imagine going into back in the day. And I love being there. I, I didn't want to leave. I think in just in terms of how long I spent there, I think my favorite town is Strawberry. Strawberry. Uh, if you want it in the kind of American parlance. I like how it feels a little more closed off than the other towns. It feels a little bit more isolated. It made the mission with Micah so much more difficult where he just kind of shoots through the, the town and the entire time I'm just like, why, why are we doing this, Arthur? Please, please, this town is nice. We don't want to ruin it. When I was trying to do things like mess around and see how wanted I could get or kind of become a little bit more infamous, I would 
sort of terrorize the town of Strawberry, which I don't feel great about, but there was also the post not that far away that I could pay off my bounty. My favorite town is definitely San Denis. To just suddenly find yourself walking down dense city streets, it really actually felt like you were a cowboy for the first time like, you know, growing up in the wilderness, wandering into a city. And it is crowded with many different types of culture. It's overwhelmingly large. And the difference of, you know, seeing all of these light bulbs everywhere, you know, it really makes them stand out. It makes it feel like living in this city or living out in the range are two completely different lifestyles. You go from like the dirt of the rest of the world to Saint Denis and you're like, I better behave myself here. I say that I didn't role play, but I definitely feel like I changed the outfit that Arthur was wearing because I really wanted to fit in. Uh, this is a bit much, ain't it? Coach? We can't bring it up there on horses like a bunch of countrified yokels. It was very common for me to pack up my horse with whatever I could find and go on long hunting trips on those narrow mountain trails. I wasn't up there for the in-game encounters so much as I was up there to search around and just see where that stream led. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my horse, who I did develop a little too close a relationship with. The sort of disdain and the anger that I felt towards any single person that hurt my horses was... I mean, bordering on evil. I'm just going to pamper you a little more today because you're a very good horse. You knew it was going to be a story of something being taken away, you know, and that's and that, that's rough. That's really rough. So the horse was just seriously the cherry on top of the tragedy Sunday. You motherfuckers, you played Shadow of the Colossus and you know how to hurt me. What has stuck with me for four years now, almost five years, is the story. That's a group of people that were it not for Dutch and Micah, I'm not entirely sure would have been a violent group of human beings in general. It's so nice for uh, Dutch to always have something to rally against, whether it's, you know, the law or the beginning of the game, it's like the O'Driscolls. And the last thing we need is to get bushwhacked by Colm O'Driscoll. Those damn O'Driscolls. The dang O'Driscolls. Those darn O'Driscolls. Those damn O'Driscolls. Oh man, that line will stick with me forever. I will always be thinking, damn O'Driscolls. The O'Driscolls are uh, a pain in the ass. I think they were good villains and it was fun to get all wrapped up in that stuff. And uh, you know, the double crossing that was happening between you know these gangs and all of the stuff, that, all the internal drama that was happening in our own gang. I thought it was fun. I always think of the line from Dodge and Arthur, where they save Sadie Adler, and they're like, We're bad men. We ain't them. They turned her into a widow. Animals. You see that they have something that they at least consider an ethical standard that they operate under. Sure, they might do bad things, but they're not really out to individually hurt people, and that was what set them apart from the Driscolls. And for me, that was like the connecting thread that I needed was having the O'Driscolls being like, okay, those, those are worse bad guys. All right, I can deal with that. So I spit at them every time. Get your horses ready. We have a train to rob. The train heist for me was really cool because it was Rockstar definitely like cashing in on what they learned with uh, Grand Theft Auto V. I feel like I'm in an old Western movie at this point, doing something that you'd see in one of those films, and it really puts you there. Here we go, here we go! All the gameplay mechanics early on, from fighting to aiming to being able to maneuver, communicate with players, everything aligns in that moment in a beautifully constructed, narrow sequence. It's a huge like stamp of intent, I think, from Rockstar to go, this is the kind of stuff you're gonna be doing in this game, and it's gonna feel epic. The fact that you could go inside the interior of the train and just look at everything and open cupboards and do all that kind of stuff, I was like, oh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be in this game for a long time. When it's, you know, one thing to see a really pretty environment, there's a bunch of trees and rocks and stuff, but when you like go into an area and especially the change in lighting and, and you know, see the, the texture of the wallpaper and the, you know, the glow coming off of those lamps, even though my, my expectations were high for this game and the level of detail Rockstar usually puts in, I was impressed. It's the first moral decision you have in the game. And even though you are robbing the train, you get to decide, are you a good outlaw? Are you kind of the Robin Hood type where you're not there to harm the innocent? Or are you, you know, the ugliest of the ugly and you're going to execute these people after 
scaring the crap out of them and then taking all their stuff. I think my favorite thing about that train heist though was getting a first impression of how all of these different uh, gang members uh, reacted to each other and how they acted. It gives you just a little snippet of how these people work together. Your cowboys, your criminals, you're trying to survive. And in that moment you get a, you get that real hard glimpse into who you, Arthur Morgan is. What about them? What do you think? I don't know. <laughs> it's up to you. Kill them, leave them here, take them with you on the train. Just make sure they don't send no folk after us, okay? The first thing I think of when I think of Red Dead Redemption 2 is its amazing protagonist, Arthur Morgan. Feels like things have changed. The whole world's changed. They don't want folk like us no more. John Marston, before I played Red Dead 2, was my favorite character in video games. But now, I think it's Arthur Morgan. I think he's one of the greatest characters in video games, period. Uh, he's so nuanced as a character. He, he's so complex and pretty much unlike any other video game character we've seen before, and specifically something we haven't really seen in Westerns. You get to see all facets of his character. You get to understand his background a little bit, kind of like with his, um, his lost love. Hello, Arthur. Mary. I love this question. Uh, what is Arthur's worst decision in Red Dead Redemption 2? Because there are a lot of bad decisions. Arthur's worst decision in Red Dead 2 is sticking around. There's a world where you can see an Arthur Morgan. It's kind of like he's out there like 10 years later with a dad bod and like two kids. And he's, you know, kind of doing his thing in like the general store in San Francisco. And he's doing all right. You know, he probably misses the, the action a little bit, but he's okay. His struggle in Red Dead 2 kind of represents the struggle of a lot of, you know, criminals of that era of, you know, like, when do I pack it up? And, and when do, you know, uh, I, you know, face that I have made it as far as I'm probably gonna make it. Following Dutch's decisions in Rhodes, I think, because that's where Arthur starts to realize just how in the wrong Dutch is. But he doesn't follow through on it, and so I think the worst decision is ultimately the fact that he stuck around with Dutch. You just, you're like, come on, Arthur, come on, snap out of it, wake up. Have some goddamn faith! Dutch is what you need in this game. He's the head of the gang. He, it is, it is his gang. It's him, you know, trying to do the best that he can for these people in certain circumstances like John and Arthur that he's brought up since they were kids. You see he's this very well-read guy, maybe too well-read. Is he a grifter? Is he somebody just trying to bring a community along and keep people fed and keep people going? Like it, it's very gray. He's such a believable, layered, intricate character. You, you you can't help but feel bad for him when things start to go south. You want things to work out, but you know they can't. And I think that makes his story so much more heartbreaking. I was gonna say you're like a son to me, but you're more than that. There's a complexity there uh, with Arthur being grateful, but Arthur also being fed up with some of Dutch's shenanigans. He wants the best initially, but he just starts to really keep on going off the rails. And it's just another thing, another thing gets worse, another thing. He's not succeeding, they never, pull anything off. It's just deep hopes and deep hopes driven farther and farther to expiration, somebody becoming more and more violent and doing things they probably wouldn't have done six months before. The more it goes on, the more you actually hate yourself for going along with it and not maybe speaking up sooner. But obviously, Arthur, you have to go along with Arthur. Until he speaks up, you can't do anything about it. And then he has this mental collapse over you know, like a 50 plus hour story. You can see Dutch unravel and it obviously culminates in, in Tahiti. I think that is a important moment in the game where Arthur really understands the gravity of the decisions Dutch is making. Dutch? What are you doing? Oh, Jesus. Easy, Dutch. What was that? Horrible old crone. But you killed her. She was gonna betray us, Arthur. Couldn't you tell? No. Well, I got some Spanish. She was. You keep killing folk, Dutch. I am just trying to make sure that some of us survive, Arthur. Arthur 
bewildered is just like why what like what have you what have you become what have we become that we're killing old ladies i remember like feeling like the tahiti section felt a little bit out of place until i got there and then i was like oh okay no we need this whole section just for this character moment i'm i'm fine with tahiti most bad men break more bad as time passes where arthur's story is that of redemption hence red dead redemption Dush is interesting that he's the reverse, and a lot of times stories are only as good as the antagonist, so uh, he just really completes the game. I know human beings, Arthur. Are you gonna strangle me next? I think Arthur's worst decision in Red Dead 2 is not shooting Micah any chance that he got. We really should get out of here. Calm yourself, woman. Like I said, I need to see something. They had something of mine. My guns. <laughs> Micah's a douchebag. <laughs> I mean, he's a rat. Oh my God, Micah's such a little worm. <sighs> he's a shit, man. I kept thinking like, there's gotta be more to Micah. There's gotta be some sort of twist. Every tale's got its liberty balance, right? I tried shooting him every chance I got and the game won't let you and that makes me very sad. What? 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 What the? I've never felt such dislike for a character before. Dutch said you was a, a big shadow cast by a tiny tree. I don't even know what that means. Mm, I thought you was a tough boy. <laughs> Not one of those gentlemen. It's so weird, but I think they did such a great job with writing him. They do such a good job of selling just how, like, punchable he is. The thing about Micah is that you're supposed to hate him right away, and boy, did I hate him. I've heard the actor who plays him describe him as, like, coming out of the swamp, and you just feel that grossness emitting off of him. For Micah, I get the impression that it's not the killing that feels so good as the wounding. They're all villains, you know, it's just a whole cast full of nasty people. And so like, obviously some of your, you know, your, your biggest hurdles that you have to get over are gonna be just a little, little nastier than you. I catch myself thinking things about Micah now and again, and then going like, Ooh, I, didn't, I didn't know I had that in me. I think my favorite moment in Red Dead Redemption 2 has to be the Micah fight. It is such an epic, monumental moment when you as a character, when Arthur Morgan is on the verge of his life, he is going to die at the end of this fight. I'm getting emotional talking about it. <laughs> That's, <f> <laughs> That's hard not for any human being to relate to a fight that takes place on a literal mountain at the peak of this moment. It's beautiful symbolism. It's absolutely remarkable. It is easily my favorite scene in that entire game. I miss Arthur in such a visceral way <laughs> that, uh, that I've never felt about anything before, film, TV show, anything. I miss Arthur so much that I wish I could forget him. I wish I could Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind Arthur out of my head. Not could, so I could replay it. I wouldn't replay it because I don't want to have to feel this loss. I mean, clearly his worst decision, really, going uh, on that mission where you have to get the money back that's owed, and that's how he gets his disease, that's how he gets tuberculosis. You borrowed money from my business partner, Herr Strauss. You owe him, you took the money. He wants it back, what's not to understand? <laughs> Obviously, you can't see it coming, but he definitely paid for it. It's a haunting experience because I mean it happens really early in the game and you don't know about it for quite a while. There was a few times where he coughs and uh, that happens throughout many conversations early in the game but it's done in such a way because the game is so natural and off the cuff and so well acted that it could be excused as just acting. You're just like, you're in the old west, you're in the dry land, you cough. There was like a cough. There's literally just like one moment uh, where, and I don't even think it was in a cutscene. I think it was actually controlling him at the time. And he just kind of coughed under his breath. And I was like, oh no. In the reveal, it was kind of like this, like, holy shit, they really are doing this. They're really positioning you to play a character who is dying. What is it? It's not good news. I guess that. You got tuberculosis. I'm really sorry for you, son. It's a hell of a thing. 
I remember swearing. I remember going, oh no, come on. If you know anything about tuberculosis during that time, there's, there wasn't a cure. They time it to a point in the game where I actually give a crap. I know Arthur well enough now to know that, no, I don't want you to die. And watching him deteriorate, watching him lose weight in game, watching his face turn red is, it, it, it's heartbreaking. I was crying at like three in the morning when I finished that part of the game. I was like, oh. It's like almost like I went through the stages of grief. I went through actual genuine denial that he had it, or maybe there was a way to save him, and maybe there was a way to help him, and uh, just see him constantly get worse and worse, and that acceptance of it was just gut-wrenching. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh my god, this f is gonna die. Like, he's gonna die, and there's, uh, he's gonna die of TB, <laughs> and there's gonna be nothing I can do about it. You just kind of see the wheels start turning in his decisions and his conversations with characters as the game goes on, and him really processing his illness. I'm afraid. It's really the story about a man coming to terms with his death and trying to do right by other people because of it. At least the way my game ended, my Arthur left a really good path for John Marston and, and he ended things he ended things the right way. Which I, I haven't. That whole epilogue felt like a love letter to fans of Red Dead Redemption 1. Discovering that 60%, 70% of the map from Red Dead 1 was in the game. I think Armadillo still definitely does have a huge place in my heart. The part of the game where you decide to play house with John. I, I just adore it. I'm just like, I'm building a happy house. I'm building a happy house. It's fun. It's fun building a house with my friends. Well, let me have a rule and a saw and a board and I'll cut it. I love it. I love that moment. I mean, everybody that's in this video has to talk about that Lenny sequence. Getting drunk with Lenny is probably one of those moments that I will never forget just because of how funny it is. Just one or two. Right off the of course, just a drink. No big drum. <laughs> Oh. I think that's one of the best, like, drunk story game simulations ever put in video games. And just the way that it kind of flashes and it's, the situation has escalated. It escalated. Oh my god. Get off, buddy. Shut up, mister. Yeah. Shut your mouth, mister. <laughs> this wonderful, memefied, joyous bonding experience and celebration of, of human debauchery and friendship. And this one was just, to me, the most hilarious where Arthur starts seeing every character in the bar as Lenny. The button for Lenny is like, it changes and the text is different and it's like spelled wrong. <laughs> found you, Lenny. Everyone's Lenny, and so when you go into this crowd and see a couple going at it, obviously they're both Lenny. I even did a spoof of it in my own video that I made where there's like a million me's. Right, Dave? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's just crazy. My favorite side quest, there's a lot of like weird, creepy stuff in this game. The weird house with the weird family uh, is probably definitely up there. Oh, oh, thank God. Hunting down that serial killer or finding the serial killer's clues. I don't know what you did to deserve this. Suddenly then, I'm on the case. I'm looking for a serial killer. Finding the, the, the UFO in the cabin at night. And then I run outside and I manage to snap a picture of it just as it's zooming back up into the sky. The guy is looking for Gavin is also a great moment where he just kind of pops up everywhere and he's looking for Gavin and I don't think he's ever gonna find his Gavin. Has anyone seen an Englishman called Gavin? Have you seen Gavin? You still haven't found him? The game does a really good job of getting to care about Jack Marston and you see him as a kid and you kind of you become protective of him as he's really the only kid in the camp. There's that mission where uh you take him fishing as Arthur. So when he gets taken and it becomes, you know, the whole the whole camp sort of rallies together. When that mission happens, when Jack is stolen and you and the gang 
are going up to the plantation. That Silverado movement there toward the end, suddenly you're in a line of, you don't even realize it. And you're all lined up on your horses and you come over that hill. It's dark out, you see everyone's silhouette. I, I got chills. The shot of Arthur Morgan and your gang lined up looking at the plantation house and that silhouette of your shadows being casted behind you into your into your lens is ingrained in my mind forever. It's remarkable. It's a painting. Because by that point in the game, you have grown such a fond connection and bond with all the characters that it's like, oh, they done f***ed up. That's like, that's all I can feel is like, I got my boys with me. I cannot believe they done that. You mess with the wrong people. You really feel that in that moment. It's very interesting when a game can get you on the side of the characters of like, I want revenge. You feel a part of the gang, right? You just feel, you feel loyalty to it. You, know, you think about where Southern mansions come from, right? Who doesn't want to watch one burn down? That's right, burn this dog to the ground. And there's that shot of the entire gang walking forward. You can hear the music playing. There's fires and it is so f***ing cool. The legacy of Red Dead Redemption 2 is, is going to be a fascinating one. The position rock star, once again, as absolute pioneers and not just AAA gaming, but visual storytelling. I like to think the legacy of Red Dead Redemption 2 is elevating storytelling in games and characters in games specifically. I really do believe that it is a American classic story. I had almost that Metal Gear Solid moment again where I was like, we could have stories like this in games? It's just a very powerful, well-told story and I didn't expect it to be as brilliant as it is. Video game storytelling can be some of the most powerful storytelling out there. I really, t I really go to the mat for Red Dead 2. It is just a damn good video game, like kind of plain and simple. It kind of made me hold open world games to a way higher standard. Having an open world that was full of stuff to do instead of having an open world that is, you know, has the same three things to do. Red Dead 2 is a game that brought millions and millions of people dozens and dozens of hours of joy each. That's the legacy, is people had a good time playing it. Red Dead Redemption 2 is, is the best game I've ever played. I actually created a show around Red Dead Redemption 2 where I took horseback riding lessons. I'd always wanted to ride horses. This got me to take horseback riding lessons. Shot a whole like cowboy mini film essentially because of it, um, because I was so inspired by the game. It's still one of my favorite things I've ever done. So I just look back as like, it's the game that inspired me to do something I love doing. I mean, we've barely scratched the surface, man. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a world and a place to get lost in. It's simply one of my favorite interactive entertainment experiences of all time to this day. I even wore my Arthur Morgan jacket. Get lost in it. Go back in time where your Clint Eastwood get up and feel like a cowboy. I have a real soft spot for Sadie Adler. Sadie stands out. Any second that I got to spend with Sadie really just, you know, like elevates that game so much. She brought something to that gang that really no one else uh, brought. She takes no sh She gives sh I would fing kill for a Red Dead DLC that lets you play as Charles or Sadie and fill in the gaps of their story.